Okay, well, here we are again <coughs> with the second part, uh, part two of our prophecy update, as we, again, kind of look at when is the Lord coming back? When are things going to narrow to such a point where, you know, we feel like, okay, this really is the, the end of the world as we know it. So, and I would say that there's a lot of things happening in today's uh, world. So are we really going to talk about the wall as in the one that's in the news the most? Not so much, okay? Um, but we are going to talk about the idea of peace and safety and kind of pick up, in a sense, where we left off last week um, and kind of go over a, a kind of a, a quick refresher on where we were, but also go into some of the things that are happening today, and is this end time that is talked about, is the last days truly upon us? Yeah, Paul? I've got one question. Yes. The question is, the thing called the United Nations, we're going to consider that a question when we look at the whole thing. Oh, absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of that actually next week. Um, we'll talk about some of that, but we're going to hint at it toward the end of, of some of this stuff and whatnot. But we'll do probably one more of these, and uh, then we'll go back to, again, chapter by chapter and verse by verse study uh, in the Word. But we're going to talk about uh, the breakers and the builders. You know, what's going on? Who's breaking things down? Who's building things up, so to speak? And... Uh, as we kind of think back again to what we spoke of last week, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3, while people are saying peace and safety, well, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So here's a picture of a woman in labor. <laughs> No, I say it looks probably a little more like that, okay? you know, that kind of thing. However, the Lord says it's going to happen suddenly. And then in verse four, but you brothers are not in the darkness so that the day should overtake you like a thief. We don't live in darkness. We live in the light. Verse five, for you are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us remain awake and sober. Like we talked about last week, the Lord said we need to keep watch. We need to pay attention to what's going on. I like what Billy Graham used to do. Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. That's me. I like that. I like the news, but I love the word, you know. I get so excited when I see things start to narrow even further and start to come to the point where we know, well, Lord, you are at the door. Well, so let us be awake and sober. Let us pay attention. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet of hope of salvation, not a heart of fear. That's my addition there. And it is easy to get fearful about some of the things that are going on, some of the frustrations that are going on in this life and in this world. But the Lord said, I, I don't want you to be like that. I want you to pay attention. But I also want you to be putting on Jesus, be putting on that breastplate of faith and love. And the helmet of what? The hope of our salvation. Okay? We can get frustrated by a lot of things, but when you and I who are saved, you and I who have asked the Lord to lead us and be uh, a part of our lives, when you and I um, think about the end game, when we think about the very end of this life, it really is the beginning of our eternal life. And... Uh, our salvation um, with the Lord. So we don't really need to fear. For God has not appointed us to suffer wrath or tribulation. 
Where was our wrath poured out? At the cross. Jesus poured out, or the Father poured out his wrath on Jesus at the cross for how many of the sins of the world? All. All the sins of the world. And so there's no more sin remaining unless you want yours back, which is why it just boils down to that choice. I'm either for the Lord or I'm against him. What do I want? Well, the Lord says we're not appointed unto wrath. So really the tribulation or wrath that is being spoken of here is that which is being poured out on those who have rejected Christ. Those who have said, God, I don't want you, don't need you, don't care about you. I'm going to do my thing my way. Well, we are not appointed unto wrath uh, or that time of tribulation, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage and build one another up just as you are already doing. Man, when I know that I don't have to go through God's wrath, that is encouraging to me. When I know that when I'm sharing the love of Jesus with somebody else, if they get saved as well, they too will find their salvation in Jesus Christ and not have to go through the wrath of the Lord. Well, that is an awesome thing. Peace and safety. Well, if you've been paying attention to the news, and some of you know, nope, I don't want to have anything to do with that, you know, um, that's fine. I'll tell, I'll tell you what's going on. <laughs> You'll know that uh, our forces are being pulled out of Syria, uh, which is just north of Israel. Um, recently. In fact, in December, um, American forces uh, and soldiers in northern Syria, um, this is essentially what uh, President Trump said, our boys and young women, our men, they are all coming back. They're coming back now. Uh, he declared uh, December 19th, 2018 on Twitter. And uh, the big question is, is this the right choice? Is this the right choice? Well, we know that one of his generals stepped down and said, you know, you deserve, as a president of the United States, somebody that agrees with you and that can work with you, not is fighting, in a sense, against you. And I don't, I don't want there to be a butting of heads uh, on these issues, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to resign and let somebody else uh, step in. You guys are probably all aware of that. And then, of course, last week there was uh, an attack um, in Syria of which um, ISIS has claimed responsibility for. I don't necessarily know that that is truly what has happened, but they're taking credit for it as well. Because when it comes to Syria, it's kind of a little weird situation. Okay, Bashir al-Assad is... Uh, the leader. His family has been a leader of that country for many, many years. And there has been a lot of uh, problems and whatnot since uh, Bashir has taken uh, over the reins, so to speak. And <clears throat> when it comes to some of the frustrations that the country has felt, uh, there's been quite a divide. And a lot of uh, infighting, a lot of civil war has broken out since 2011 and a lot of damage has been done to that country and really uh, what this is all about is power 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 who's got the power you know um, but when it comes to the kind of the political mix is where the US has gotten involved with some of this you have enemies of Bashir uh, al-Assad, who we are giving weapons to, and then they are going and fighting there. But at the same time, they're also considered terrorists to a certain extent because they're also uh, firm believers in the Islamic faith and have no problem you know, fighting in that way as well. So we're kind of giving weapons to our enemy so that they can fight their enemy. But when we pull out, then then what happens? You know, um, who's 
got the weapons, that kind of thing. Well, that's where this whole argument, is this the right move to pull out of there? What's going to happen? Are things going to destabilize? Well, <clears throat> Ezekiel 38, we talked about this last week in regard to the war um, that will uh, occur in, in that area against Israel, mainly. Um, the Lord says there in verse 11, I will invade the land of unwalled villages. I will attack um, peaceful and unsuspecting people. Who is this? More than likely, it, it, it's Russia being pulled down. In fact, the Lord says, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw and I will bring you down. I'm going to bring you there and you're going to be there for peace and for safety. But really, as we talked about last week, you're going to take a spoil. You're there to take oil. Spoil, oil, it's all pretty much what that whole region is about <clears throat> other than religious differences. Well, the, uh, the invasion will occur. And then in verse 14 of uh, 38, um, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In that day, when my people are living in safety, you or will you not take notice of it? You will come from your place in the far north and you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army, you will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. We talked about this last week, that this invasion, in a sense, is going to occur, is going to seem very overwhelming, as though it's impossible for Israel to defeat any such an army, any such conglomeration uh, or buildup of military force against them. However, God is going to step in as we continued uh, to read about in chapter 38. Well, let me kind of send you to the maps, give you a little bit of background um, about Syria. You've got Damascus there, you've got <coughs> Dara or Dara, depending on your pronunciation there. But here's another <coughs> map from the far north. When you look at Israel uh, down there, um, you have the Golan Heights right there. Uh, you have Lebanon just to the west of Syria, but essentially the due north you, um, from Syria, you have Turkey, and above Turkey you have Russia, Russia essentially. Okay. You also have Iraq there, but you, um, you also have Iran uh, to deal with, and Russia and Iran are, are very much buddy-buddy. So how did this conflict really get to going? We've kind of hinted at some of it. But under Assad, um, they had a horrific economy. Um, unemployment, horrific. Um, and uh, the people revolted. Back in <coughs> Obama's day, uh, when he was president, um, we saw him using chemical weapons against his people. Um, and we said, hey, this is the red line. And yet we still did nothing about it. Um, well... <coughs> Uh, there was a, a group of school-age youth who went and uh, put a bunch of graffiti uh, on a wall um, uh, around their school and uh, the community and whatnot, and the government was not happy about that and arrested the youth. Well, moms and dads were not happy about that, and as a result, they protested in the streets. Those protests turned very ugly and deadly as uh, the government came once again against their people. And uh, again, this essentially started this civil war uh, because other neighboring countries, um, which was kind of known as the Arab Springs, or in a sense the uprising, the, the, the spring is here, we're going to come into power, we're going to take over. And so they tried to essentially overthrow Assad and that government. But when you have um, power, when you have weapons that are not only coming from I Iran, but also from Russia, um, it's a whole different ball game, you know. And when you have essentially a handful of guns, rocks, and sticks, um, you know, it can be uh, quite a war. Well, the government, um, at least to 
the best of our knowledge uh, has killed over a half a million people there, which is why we are there. We are there to try and stabilize this area. And you remember the whole ISIS uh, Islamic State uh, situation that was there. They were taking over so many different areas and there were so many attacks. And when Trump took office, whether you like him or not, they went in there and said, okay, the gloves are off. And we haven't really heard a lot about IS or the Islamic State. We haven't heard a whole lot of those uh, those things up until recently. So this new attack that has happened, we really don't know if it's the enemy that we're giving weapons to so that they are coming against Assad or truly the Islamic State. Why? They may want us to stay. And so they're going to do anything they can to make it look as though there is still a problem when there may not be really all that much of a problem right now. Well, that is kind of um, some of, of what is going on. Is Assad still in power? Absolutely he is. Um, how? Because he's backed by Russia and he's backed by Iran. Okay. If we pull out, there is a highway that leads right from essentially Iran into Syria, um, which is currently guarded. Um, but if we go away, there's a possibility that we may see more weapons moving into uh, southern Syria uh, in an effort to attack Israel from there as well. I don't know. Time will tell. But let's um, continue on. <clears throat> in the days to come, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. So that the na nations may know who? God. In this whole mix of things that are going on, who is ultimately in control all of the time? God is. Israel is the focal piece. Israel is the nation, that small little sliver, that knife in the desert, um, so to speak, is what it's all about. Is this a physical battle? Yes, it is. But deep down, that is not it. Because the scripture clearly states that we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers of darkness. And so the Lord is simply saying, look here, this is a spiritual battle. Have you noticed that even here in America, we are starting to see so much more of a battle against Jesus, against God, against the things of the Lord, absolutely. And I believe that we're going to continue to see those things um, press on as we come closer and closer to the end. Well, the Lord says here, I am going to pull Russia down into this mix. They are there now, but I'm going to pull them down into this. And when this battle begins, I am going to prove myself God, which is interesting. Because if this war takes place and all of these people gang up against Israel, and though Israel does not have a whole lot of uh, room, in a sense, to breathe, so to speak, because they're confined to that one little area, which is why they attack so quickly. You know, if they get nuked off the planet, where do they have to go? They have no homeland. That is all they have. And so they are very quick to respond. Because it's, their, it's the last thing they have. Well, <clears throat> if this war takes place, the entire world, I shouldn't say if, when this war takes place, the entire world is going to see God step in and protect his people. And when they do, that may bring about a, tempor a temporary peace. We may even see this war. But it might bring a peace that... Though it won't be lasting until the Lord comes back, it may be something where everybody seems to be, in theory, dwelling in peace and safety. Well, <clears throat> builders and breakers. Um, let's talk about Russia a little bit. Is Russia really there for what they say they are there? Peace. If you have been following 
news in Russia and those kinds of things, what's their economy looking like? It's bad. They have a devastated economy. And how do you change that? Boy, I'll tell you what. If you control oil, you control the money, so to speak, as we talked about a little bit last week. But <clears throat> um, the Lord says, I will turn thee back. I will put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horsemen, horses, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And of course, um, that being spoken of uh, as far as uh, Russia being pulled down <coughs> into this mix. So Russia did get pulled into this mix because um, they were going to help uh, Assad um, fight ISIS in that area. Many of the experts in Russian foreign policy really don't know what to think about Russia's involvement there. Are they really there to help or are they not? It is really hard to say because the weapons that are being fought with from the government standpoint are Russian. They're Russian weapons and they are being used against uh, people. Um, maybe even some of the chemicals that have been used against the people have been brought in from Russia. As you know, oh, some months ago, there was uh, quite a controversy when um, a few supposed spies uh, got taken out over in Europe uh, by a chemical attack and whatnot. And of course, Russia was also blamed for that. Um, it is interesting to watch uh, this whole uh, thing unfold and, and start to, to really um, uh, heat up, in a sense, down there. Well, <clears throat> Russia is an ally of Syria, and Assad did go up uh, and ask Putin to come down and help. Um, is it working? Well, Putin, in recent meetings with Syria, Turkey, Iran, and several others, um, they are said to, they want to build up an anti-terror alliance. That is Putin's words. We are here to build up an anti-terror alliance. The problem is your definition of terrorism or terrorist really does change, doesn't it? Our view in the United States uh, isn't necessarily what they believe down there in the Middle East. A lot of them look at Israel as the terrorist, that they are the ones that are occupying our land. And yet, who gave them that land? God did, many, many years ago. Well, um, and uh, senior Arab diplomat, uh, Putin's preparing for the end game, which I find an interesting choice of words. He is looking at uh, to outmaneuver the American-backed anti-ISIS group that is also backed by 70 other countries. This is exactly what we're pulling out of right now. Um, and Russia once again demonstrates that it is a superpower uh, and it's back. That is what's coming out of Moscow news. They are basically saying this just a month or two ago. Hey, we're a superpower again. Are they really? Builders and breakers, right? Who, who are the builders? Who are the breakers? We both have weapons. We both are, you know, hey, I'm hiding my bomb behind my back. And hey, let's be friends. When we know that the Lord says that we're going to be hearing this term, peace and safety. Peace, peace, but there will be, what? No peace. So, are we in another Cold War? <laughs> yes. Um... <clears throat> This is what has been said recently, especially coming out of Europe, um, that Russia has been identified essentially by um, much of even the UN, Paul, as, as you were talking about, that they are a global challenge. In other words, they're everybody's problem. <laughs> and uh, they have a lot of weapons. What are we talking about? Well. Some of the planes that are being used currently in Syria, um, the Su-24, it is a, by their uh, determination, quote, a pre-nuclear uh, deterrent um, airplane. 
or aircraft. Um, we don't really want to release nuclear weapons, so we're going to use our big guns, and anybody that stands in our way, we're going to wipe out. Um, these are pretty amazing. Um, and a uh, little better than the F-16s that Israel bought many, many, many years ago um, from the United States because we, we sold them because they had a, a huge blind spot uh, in them that you couldn't see. And what did Israel do? They bought up the planes and stuck a little um, Volkswagen mirror in the back, and you can see the blind spot. And so they got a great deal. Um, but those are getting old, um, as are the, uh, the 35s, um, which are a pretty sophisticated little plane as well. Um, but these are the big guns. Um, the Armada, which is the tank, uh, there is a highly automated tank um, that the... Uh, that the Russians uh, have, and uh, it is incredibly sophisticated. Um, we also have some of the biggest, which has been the biggest argument that we've had in the last three years in this country, which is the electronic interference of Russia mm -hmm. and, uh, and some of the things that are going on digitally um, as far as that goes. Um, and... You know how that's going on. We're going to essentially, because we didn't win in the White House, we're going to try and point some fingers. Now, again, I don't want to get into so much of the politics and who you're for, <coughs> who you're against, but it is always interesting to me when somebody stands up on their high horse and starts pointing fingers and saying something relatively out of the blue. You have to just say, hmm, what have you been involved in? And we do know that over the years, there seems to be deals made uh, with Russia uh, and America and some of the political people involved in that, uh, and nothing's happening. Why was there, why was there no justice uh, for some of these things? Well, again, I believe that it is not wrestling against flesh and blood, but this is what? Principalities and powers. I believe that Satan is alive and well and that he is at war even here in America. And uh, it's interesting to see what's going to happen. You know, um, it's fascinating. Also, this is, this is an interesting uh, little weapon down here in, in the bottom corner. Uh, the zircon, which is kind of a very plentiful um, basically mineral or crystal um, that is all over the place uh, in the earth, but a lot of people believe that crystals bring things into balance. So I think the name is quite poignant, um, that there is a balance of power now in regard to this missile being produced and in December tested uh, in Russia. This little baby... Uh, it's a hypersonic missile. What does that really mean? <laughs> it means it goes really, 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 really fast. Uh, how fast? 1.7 miles per second. Okay, per second. Almost two miles a second. That means to travel from, if we launched it here uh, in Crescent City and dumped it in the ocean on the other side of the United States, literally it would be about 27 minutes to get from one side of the United States to the other. That is, that is incredibly fast. Well, what's the problem with this thing? Don't, don't we have one? We have one in the works. It'll be ready about 2023. 2023, that's, that's five years. You know, we are so far behind, which is why we're hearing our government talk about, we need to put some money into weapons you're not, we haven't done anything for so long now, and Russia has all this fancy stuff. They are in the Middle East. They are there to keep peace, but peace, peace, there will be no peace. Well, this bad boy, we have no answer to. Why? At uh, two miles per second, how do you detect that? You can't. There is nothing there. There's nothing in anybody's uh, 
stockpile that can, can even see this thing. There's other weapons that they have that are so low flying that they can fly about 30 feet off the ground. They can change directions in, in mid-flight and, and uh, retarget. Um, it is amazing. It is unbelievable to see exactly what is happening in the world today as far as uh, weapons go. Well, <clears throat> when we look at uh, a prophecy in Isaiah 17, uh, Damascus, Syria, used to be an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous city. Beautiful. But in Isaiah 17, the Lord declares very clearly... Um, and it says, this is a prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. The city of Aurora will be deserted, left to the flocks, which will lie down with no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and royal power from Damascus. The remnant of uh, Aram will be like the glory of the Israelites, declares the Lord Almighty. It is very likely that Israel is going to be the one to wipe out Damascus as if we pull out, we begin to see more things unfold in Syria and more of a Russian influence as they try to rebuild um, Syria, which is really what they're saying they want to do. We want to be the ones that build in Syria. But really, I believe that that's not the case because prophecy says something different. God says something different, that they are there to take a spoil. And I believe that to be true. Well, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so why pull out our military? Again, Trump, Israel can defend herself. This, again, after his announcement at the very end of December, the 27th, uh, Israel can defend herself with the billions that the U.S. Give, uh, or gave it. Uh, Trump said, I spoke with Bibi, meaning Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, that is his nickname, uh, Bibi Netanyahu. He said, I told Bibi, you know, uh, we give Israel $4.5 billion a year and they are doing very well at defending themselves. In 2016, the United States and Israel have signed, or back then they signed a huge $38 billion deal for military aid to the Jewish state. And the 10-year agreement is the largest in U.S. history, uh, with a significant portion of the money expected to be used to upgrade Israel's Air Force uh, to the Lockheed uh, Martin F-35 uh, fighter aircrafts, which they do have, and um, are a uh, pretty pretty maneuverable uh, piece of machinery, uh, pretty intense. Well, um, why do they need them? After all, in southern Syria, I mean, who's, who's really attacking Israel? Uh, not many folks right now, huh? Right now, it seems to be fairly peaceful and fairly safe, but... When there is an attack, well, yeah, but they, they have these little missiles that they lob over the fence, you know, and they're, it's almost like trying to throw a softball a couple miles. You know, you don't know if you're going to hit something. Every once in a while they get lucky and they'll hit something in Haifa or, you know, one of those uh, particular areas. But Israel doesn't put up with it. They go over there and they just wipe them out. Uh, recently, they uh, went on a raid and went in with F-16s with, you know, the bunker buster bombs that we provide them, and they were ultimately unsuccessful at that raid, so they brought in these F-35s, and um, it was a done deal. So it is very likely that because Israel being so small and having no other place to go, that they are not going to allow any buildup. Um, of any weaponry. They have been talking about also um, striking first against Iran, if you've been paying attention over the last year or two, because of the nuclear capabilities that they are bringing to the table as well. Bottom line, um, why are we pulling out? It may be exactly what Trump said. It could be that uh, President Netanyahu is saying, look, we got this. You know, we're okay. You know, 
will be fine. Um, and uh, will they? Absolutely. Who's on their side? God. If it's you and God, you're the majority. So, you know, God's going to protect them. And so it could be that um, BB is saying, hey, thanks for, again, doing what so many presidents said they were going to do, which was move uh, the embassy to Jerusalem and uh, continuing to be our friend and supporting us with the biggest amount of, of military support uh, that we could ever imagine, but we got this. It could be something like that. <clears throat> or it could be that we're just saying, hey, we've got our own problems at home. We've got our own people that are hurting at home, um, and we need to take some care of some stuff. Either way, is Israel going to be okay? <laughs> yeah, they will be. Well, <clears throat> the wall builders. Am I saying that Donald Trump is a builder? Uh, I don't know about that, but we're hearing a lot about the wall down south and whatnot. I'm not getting into whether we should build a wall or whether we shouldn't build a wall. What I'm getting at is, what is this about? It's about power. Power, power. Who has uh, ultimately the power? Um, and hopefully this will work. Come on. Oh, you got to love technology, huh? It's loading. I have a video for you. Um, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, because it's saying, it's not responding. I can tell. <clears throat> maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Let's restart the program. We are on slide 21. We'll see if we can make this thing work. But essentially, what this video and what this, at least this initial video, is um, is really doing is uh, talking about um, <coughs> the uh, the wall and everybody saying essentially. Um, the same thing. All right, let's see if we can get back to this. <laughs> Maybe not. It's working, it's not working, it's working, it's not working. Hey, there we go. Okay, so now that I've told you what the video is basically all about, um, Obama said, let's build a wall. Um, Nancy Pelosi has said, let's build a wall. Um, who else? Chuck Schumer has said, let's build a wall. Um, back in 2006, when um, uh, the Republicans had control there, they also not only said, let's build a wall, but they set money aside already. So it's not a question of whether or not they want a wall. <laughs> Everybody wants a wall. But this doesn't really feel like building a wall, does it? What does it feel like? It feels like a bunch of school kids on the playground fighting over the swing. It's my swing. I'm the president. No, it's my swing because we have control of the house. And, you know, it's this back and forth. And who suffers? Everybody. All of the people. Does this feel like a government that is for the people? No, it really doesn't. And that's what we're going to see around the world. The government is no longer for the people, I believe. Do I believe that there are some in our government today that are for the people? Yeah, I truly do. I believe that there are those that are standing up and saying, look, we are not getting into this globalization of, um, um, come on. <clears throat> we're not going to get into, um, you know, some of the uh, the issues that we're having um, here. I want you to listen to uh, to this, and I want us to understand what we're, if it'll play for us. If not, I'll tell you what it says. Okay. 
So essentially, what this is getting into is when Trump went to the UN, um, when he went to the UN, he got up there, he gave his speech, and he said that America is not into globalization, but rather we are into patriotism. We do not want to be a part of this whole unwall the borders. Let there be one economy. Let there be this free flow of people back and forth that can come and go whenever um, they want. You guys can't see anything. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so that is essentially what uh, was in that video, was essentially uh, Trump saying, look, you know, we want to make America great again, but we also want you as individuals to be great as well. Keep your identity rather than have this globalization where all the walls are taken down, all the borders, we're all one big happy family. Because the reality of that is just simply not true. Okay? Well, the recent boom um, has largely been supported and by uh, developed uh, countries, that be this, this globalization movement. Um, uh, developed um, economies integrating with developed countries through foreign uh, direct investment, um, lowering uh, of costs uh, of doing business, and the reduction of trade barriers, and in many cases, cross-border migration. In other words, no more walls. There is no more passports needed, uh, any of that kind of stuff. While globalization has uh, radically Increased incomes in economic uh, and economic growth in developing countries and lowered consumer prices in developed countries, it also changes the what? The power balance. What is this all about? This is not about building a wall. This is about power, power. I want the power. This is about we need to change. In fact, Years ago, the video um, that had uh, Obama up there was essentially uh, prior to him or within five days of him becoming president. He essentially said what? That America will necessarily need to change. We are about to fundamentally change America as we know it. What does that even mean, right? Well, this is what it means. It means tear down the borders. It means become part of this global economy and uh, government that is running the lives of everybody else. We know that government, for the most part, in every country, really believes that they are the smartest, that they are the brightest, and, um, and there is a war between them about power. Power, power, who has the power. So this whole thing about the wall, people being furloughed, um, things like that, it, it is a power struggle, but I also believe that it is uh, to try and show that America is not wanting to be involved in the globalization uh, that we're seeing around the world. Um, <clears throat> see if I can't bypass... Um, these particular uh, videos, although I really do wish that this one would play. Um, and we'll see if it will load um, because it is um, quite interesting. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's saying it's playing even though I know it's not. <laughs> ah, yay, yay. Okay, so, again, I will describe to you what's happening in the video. 
Um, see if we cannot get past it anyway. <clears throat> and bring you kind of up to speed on what really is, is being done. Um, in there, in the EU, now you know that I talked last week and we were talking about some of the troubles with the Brexit. Uh, Britain exiting this EU conglomerate of nations and some of the things that are going on. The people, as per parliament there, um, voted to exit uh, out of the European Union. They said, nope, nope, we want to be on our own. They took a vote um, here the other day, and it is kind of a crack up because when you think of English uh, people, they're very polite and just so and everything. No, it was chaos um, in that parliament, and you have the leader of parliament um, yelling, Order! Order! And it was kind of a crack up to see um, so much of a fight there, but they took a vote. Parliament took a vote, not the people. The people have already voted to what? To leave the European Union. People are saying, well, wow, how does this really work? If they leave the Union, then the whole EU is probably going to fall apart. You know? And so the people voted. They said, we want out of here. And um, May, uh, Theresa May, um, who probably is likely on her way out, um, basically sat there and said, look, the people voted for this. We need to provide this for them. Parliament took a vote, and in a significant uh, landslide, they, Parliament, government, said, no, we will stay in the EU, which is fascinating to me, because the people no longer have a vote. It is the fact that government is going to control everything. So, is May on her way? And is Trump getting the bump? Um, time will tell. It is going to be fascinating to see uh, what is really going to happen there. But this whole unrest in the, uh, uh, in the EU and the unrest in the U.S. Uh, doesn't feel like peace, peace. So... Um, somebody's getting an important phone call, but he's not here to take it. So <laughs> it'll go to voicemail. Don't worry about it, right? Well, oh my, look at the time. Let's wrap this up. So the EU does look like it's going to remain intact <clears throat> in spite of what we were kind of thinking um, because not because the people are wanting it, but because the government is wanting it. Does that mean that there is going to be a... Um, yeah, that's possible. It might have been like, Kirk, you're 10 minutes uh, over, so... <laughs> um, but uh, it could be that the government is saying, no, we don't really care, and the people saying it should be our way, and there could be civil unrest that we see in Europe due to some of these things, as well as what we talked about last week, the possibility of unrest and uh, possible civil war here, even in uh, America. We will see what happens. Regardless, everybody is looking for a savior, a messiah, right? Well, here he is. I told you I'd tell you who the Antichrist is. No, I'm kidding. <coughs> so, this is interesting, and... Um, the reason that I joke about that is uh, because he is a fascinating character. Emmanuel Jean Michel Frederick Macron, the president of uh, France currently, who won in a significant landslide and whatnot. But has France really been um, going, things going smoothly there with the whole yellow jacket coalition? And hey, we don't want all of our income taxed. We don't want to give half or more of our money um, or 60% of our income to the government so that they can go take care of global warming. Um, you know, it is fascinating. 
But it is also interesting that this man, and we will get into some of this next week, that this man has said, I am going to rule like the god Jupiter, which is interesting. And it sounds remotely familiar to, to what? It sounds remotely familiar to something that happened many, 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 many years ago when Antiochus uh, Epiphanes uh, went into the temple and set up a god, Zeus, or some would say um, Jupiter, and some of the things that were happening there. Um, this man is wanting to rule with an iron fist. Is he? Yeah. We literally turn on the TV, and when you look at um, France, uh, they're in uh, civil unrest, and the government is essentially trying to keep everything under control. Well, this guy is the leader, and Again, I joke that this is the Antichrist because we don't know who he is. But the Lord um, has mentioned a few things about him. And I liked what, um, when I was doing some research on this guy, one of the guys that was saying, oh yeah, this is prophetic, this is the guy. He's the Antichrist, he said. And you can tell because of his name. Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we know that he's not God. So you can tell by somebody's name. You know what? I have a lot of uh, Mexican friends, and some of them have the name Emmanuel, but that doesn't mean that you're the Antichrist, okay? <laughs> Silliness, things like that that we hear. What, what is interesting about this guy is uh, his charisma. The fact that the people, not so much in France, but in all the rest of Europe, really love this guy. He is an economist. He is a banker that worked for uh, Rothschild. If you um, know any of the history about that, we'll give a little background next week on some of that. But I do find it interesting that the economist paper shows him, um, is, is this Europe's savior? And what is he doing there in the, the article? He is, um, he, there we go. He's walking on water. What did they say about Obama when he became president in Europe? They were calling him the what? The Messiah. And that really didn't work out, did it? And so, is the world looking for a savior? Absolutely they are. Is America looking for somebody to save them? Yes, absolutely we are. Uh, but here's the thing. We have a savior. We have Jesus Christ who is in control and regardless of what we're seeing in the news, he has a plan and things are going to unfold according to his will and his way. But for those of us who are saved, those of us who are on our way to heaven, do we have to worry? No. In fact, Isaiah 26.3 says that God will keep us in perfect peace when we do what? Set our mind upon him. And uh, that is a, a great thing. Vicki? Yeah, I just uh, think of that all the time. You can only have the power of the guy you serve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that is very true. The living creator God, when push comes to shove, you have his power. Mm -hmm. If you serve Macron in the EU, the President Trump, then if your mind is number one on him, you can only have the power he can give you when push comes to shove. Yep. So I always like what um, what Joshua said: "As for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord." Yes. Amen. Yep. Absolutely. So, whether they're a builder or a breaker, or seemingly, the world is headed this narrowing mm -hmm. to a global economy. Uh, it is narrowing to the one world government where one guy uh, makes all the decisions. And where will there be peace? Yes. But it will only be temporary. And uh, But with us, our peace uh, in Jesus Christ is permanent, and I like that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we don't have to worry about these things, but sure is fascinating, Lord, to look around and see, Father, you at work, that, Father, you are bringing all of this uh, together in order to accomplish your will. And what is your will? 
to protect your people Israel, but also, Lord, to capture us out, to rapture us up to be with you in heaven. And, Lord, you will do away with sin once and for all. And uh, you truly will be the Savior of the entire world. And, Father, we can't wait for that day. But, Lord, until then, you've given us a job to go out into the world and preach the good news. And so, Father, I pray that with the hope of our salvation, with the peace that we have in our hearts, knowing, Lord, that you are in control, that we would go out and share with folks because they do long to hear as so many of the things are unsettling in the news. Father, how much more appropriate is it for us to be sharing of the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, give us the words, give us the strength, give us the boldness to go out in your name and with your spirit and share so that others may uh, get saved and go to heaven and we can all be one big happy family with you forever and ever. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. One more next week, and then we'll get to kind of uh, back to the, the, the things that we're um, normally dealing with uh, in our chapter-by-chapter -chapter study. So God bless you. Have a great week.